what were your um when you said you kind of went in and and the first the first day there at the uh the first group you landed in was with with mm-hmm. Mike and Tom right what were your expectations or anticipations and then were they met or how did they shift or what did you learn from that well wow I'm not sure. I, I really try not to have an expectation. So um, I think for me going into that group, uh, maybe my expectation was actually, I didn't think that the group I walked into was going to be what it was going to be. Um, I thought it would be more serious, mm-hmm. you know? And then when I kind of saw everybody laughing and joking, and then we started this game, um, I think, again, I I decided I needed to be myself and not the clinical person. I needed to be a human being. Yeah, I have experience. Yeah, I have education. But I felt like I really needed to show these men my humanness, that we may be different, but we're not, right? Um, So I think I was trying to to go from a different approach rather than more of a clinical. It's more of that human heart-to-heart kind of thing. I, I, I can relate to that as a practitioner. You know, we spend a lot of time as professionals, I think, honing our clinical skills and whatnot. But when I, I've noticed in my own professional career that when you really just break it down and become authentic and relate to your patients, that's when the magic happens, you know? Right. And we can fix teeth all day long, but we can, you know, but are you relating to that person that you're treating? There's a human being there. You know, exactly. so I get it. Yeah. I think wow. that's going to be, a, I think that's going to be a big part of, you know, having Tim have that understanding from doing some work already with some veterans out there um, mm-hmm. throughout his, you know, 25 years and then leading into this, you know, when we start doing our clinics with Vets mobile dental unit um, and realizing that and for everyone to understand that because we're going to have dentists come in you know, with their assistants and, and hygienists come in for a day to volunteer or two days or whatever it is. But it's going to be really important that we even kind of come up with a, a, a pre-screening for sure, but also just kind mm-hmm. of a pre-informative class, if you will. Class isn't the right word, but just to kind of mm-hmm. spin people up on like, look, this, these are people that served at all different capacities. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that could be going on just beyond, you know, the dental care that they need. And so, sure. um, it, it's so needed and having that understanding that like you're saying, you know, um, like, you know, Tim just kind of reiterated having that, you know, that human connection beyond just taking care of teeth all day, you know, that's going to well, be, well, that's huge. where I think, you know, that's where that huge trust factor comes into place between a practitioner and the patient. And if you can't relate to your patient, they're not going to trust you. They may not trust you. And, you know, and if you're, if you kind of overdo it on the clinical side um, and you're not relating humanly, then I think we're kind of missing the point there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for us, and this is why the icebreaker of the game Things was so important. (laughs) It taught them to write comedy. It would be like, you know, just being real quick, uh, things you wouldn't want to say to the paramedics on the way to the hospital. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) I think think portions of my anatomy are back at the scene. Can we stop and check before we go, right? And then people are making up all these lines, and you're howling, and everybody right. laughing breaks the ice of the post-traumatic stress disorder that they're in. Many of these guys, and I use this term advisedly, have present traumatic stress disorder. They are four months off a battlefield searching for opioids to numb themselves, not from the battle injuries, but from the severity of the trauma to their brains, their heads, their necks, their backs, from, you know, many of them uh, were not just war wounded. They were uh, good, fine, decent young men who had been adjudicated into the system by courtrooms for being involved in criminal activity. And we were trying to, to 
salvaged the sadness of their lives for the greater good. And Kim became an ex exceptional therapist in doing that. And, and now you're on, and you know, one of the differences now you're on the hospice work and working there as well, because mm -hmm. you're trying to help nurture and comfort people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. What have you learned from all of that together, Kim? Because you're, you know, I mean, you're an artist. You're the daughter of a veteran. You're a mom. You've got a teenage kid who's a genius and gorgeous. You got everything going on here. And you've been a, a Napa superstar in basketball, you know. And uh, I could never block your shot. I can hardly dribble except for <laughs> a sandwich. So uh, <laughs> what have you learned from all of, uh, all of that pushing forward through it? Because – you did your super competitive end side. You proved yourself to yourself as an athlete. Then you got into therapy and, and hairstyling, which is you are a therapist like my daughter. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> more True. The problem when you're touching them and rotating their head or massaging mm -hmm. their neck, whatever. What, what is the culmination of how you've moved through this line of work into hospice work? Well, I have to tell you, why I got into the work in the first place. So I was 15 years old and there was a movie called, it was with a John Ritter and Alfred Woodard. Alfred yep. Woodard played a Chicago VA worker. It was a real story. Uh, Maude de Victor, who discovered that men that served in Vietnam were dying of like stomach cancer, different kinds of cancers. And they're 30 years old. So the, the movie's called Unnatural Causes. The moral of the story is, is this Chicago VA worker, they're like, nope. Sorry, we, we're going to stick you literally in a broom closet. We don't want people knowing um, that Agent Orange was basically killing our men and, and women, I'm sure, too. The nurses that were, uh, were there as well. So that was like 1986. I was 15, I think, something like that. I went to wow. the VA. I went to this, the Yonville VA at 15 years old, and I interviewed a gentleman who served in Vietnam, and I did a report on Agent Orange, which still makes me want to cry because I still have my report, which I did get an A. Um, and... Um, what really gets me is I've taken care of two men who are dying right now um, who served in Vietnam on hospice. Oh, um, wow. And it, it, it's, you know, it's awful, but it's full circle because I, when I left the VA that day, I said, and it, it's like my own little quiet prayer, which I forgot because now I'm 49. So, you know, I, <laughs> I've had a few TBIs myself, so I'm a little forgetful. Um, but I promised I was going to do something for Vietnam veterans. So that's really where it started for me to come to work for hospice is like a full circle for me that I get to be there. I actually gave, um, it's very emotional. So I've actually wrote a song for Vietnam vets, which um, I'll play with for you at some point. Um, I actually wanted to play a John Prine song in, in his honor. Um, but so I, 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 we give these medallion, a, a coin, you know, those, they call them challenge coins, right? So I, I had hospice buy some that were all the branch of the military. And when I give this coin, I can't tell you the response is so overwhelming uh, at times for a veteran here I am, right? Huh? Overwhelming in what way, hon? Emotional. They're touched so deeply by this coin that I, that I, um, that I care. You know, and um, yeah. I've had um, I've had a few. I had one. <laughs> we have these ninety-something-year-old independent, strong women. That uh, I've had two. One was a Marine, World War II Marine, female. Wow. Um, ah, oh, they're a family of Marines. Their son served in Vietnam, so I got to honor him as well. And um, and then I had another Army. She was like a captain. Oh my God, she was funny. She was great. So you know. When I wasn't able to get a VA job, right, I, d I had to trust God that God was going to bring me in a place. And we're hospice in Napa, at Calabria Care Hospice. I get to be there for veterans, you know, um, and I get to be there for families. And I think the hardest thing about working for hospice is I cannot fix them. I cannot take their pain away, but I can show up with love. And I think working with combat vets taught me that. I can show up. I love them. I do the best I can. Now I can't hug them, which is really irritating because um, of this COVID-19. So I'm masked up and I do Zoom. But um, 
love, man. It's like, it sounds so cliche, but it's the truth. You show up with as much love and compassion and as, as much help as you can. You know what I love about you, Miss awesome. Kelly? What? Everything. <laughs> you are the living so embodiment of who I think everybody should have taken care of them at any time in their life. Your laughter, your joy, your fun, your spontaneity. You're, you're such a smart ass, you can sit on an ice cream cone and tell us what flavor it is. Right. You're all- <laughs> <laughs> People edit that out. People I, edit I was, that out. Well, well, I was just thinking, you know, you say you can show up with love, but you can also show up with some, some good BJ jokes, it sounds like. Yeah. Too, so. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> Do you remember? There's a picture of me in the Santa Rosa press Democrat. Yes. Because one of our guys, I don't know if you remember Dustin. Oh, yeah. The Army Sergeant oh, who yeah. became a hedge fund guy. He's a genius guy <laughs> and very super smart. And his soliloquy about almost suiciding in front of his wife and being in the driveway was epically frightening, you know. And, I mean, we all just sat there frozen in time. But that guy, when we were playing, we were playing <clears> – <throat> in front of the senior citizen my wives and, and husbands up there and they're in right. their 80s and 90s world war ii folks and he dropped i i told him i said dustin do not put that card in there because you can't oh, write right. that that's so dirty you can't you can't say that in front of them and one of the old ladies says i'm not gonna go in <laughs> it was <just> a <laughs> <laughs> what is what is that? And the other one just goes, "Oh, it's a blankety blank." And I go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> god we weren't filming because I was like, "Oh, oh!" And the guy from the photographer took a picture of me with my hands on my chest in front of a ninety-year-old woman, and none of them because their husbands were combat. Uh, Guys, and they just went, oh, okay, who cares, right? <laughs> and dying laughing, but Thank you for joining us in the barracks. To learn more about our hosts, guests, and how to support Vets Mobile Dental Unit, visit www.inthebarracks.org.